Okay, so the topic I said I'll address very briefly here today is uh, liberal and international education uh, drawing selectively, very selectively, on the Yale experience. So uh, the birth of the new millennium in the aftermath of the end of the Cold War and in the midst of a decade of prosperity that uh, some commentators have compared to the Gilded Age of, American, uh, of America 100 years earlier was also a time when there was fairly serious debate in the US Academy about the scope, content, and purpose of international education. And this debate was joined across universities, public and private, big and small, and as well as liberal arts colleges that focused mostly on providing an intimate and exclusive learning environment to small groups of students, as you heard so well in the previous presentation by David. It was also a debate that was joined by research foundations, uh, other foundations that historically had supported the arts and sciences in the US, and varieties of think tanks of all polit political persuasion. The early 2000s, in that sense, was a period of ferment in which a lot of people in leadership positions in higher education paid a lot of attention to what it would mean for institutions young and old to be more international than they had been. Now, Yale University participated in this ferment. Under the able leadership of a visionary president entering the second decade of his accomplished presidency, detailed plans were drawn up to take Yale into a far more international century. Today, in the few minutes that I have, it won't be possible to review the broader debate and discussion that emerged across universities in the US 15 years ago that I alluded to in the beginning, nor to document in any detail how Yale joined this debate and acted to chart its own course towards this new internationalization, if, if we can call it that. Uh, but I do want to place before this group some aspects of how Yale has approached this internationalization process in the last 10 years to join this discussion on liberal education and how the wider world is imagined, shapes, and ultimately becomes a site for the development of excellence in higher education. So the former president I've referred to already, Richard Levin, uh, who was Yale's president for 20 years till, till a few months ago, uh, identified uh, several aspects uh, that are often cited in various documents that review Yale's international efforts. And I'll just mention the ones that I think are most relevant to our discussion today. Uh, this effort, he had often said, should signal distinct changes in the substance of teaching and research, uh, the demographic, uh, characteristic of students, then the scope and breadth of external collaborations, and engage the university with new kinds of audiences. Now, each of these aspects, arguably, has been the subject of attention in US colleges and universities long before the early 2000s. In the second half of the 20th century alone, even if we do not look further back, sweeping curricular reforms had begun to take place. There was a debate, some of you may remember, on the core curriculum, including something called the Western Civilization's core. New programs and departments were formed across the sciences. Other fields were renamed to signal their scope, their new scope and discoveries in many universities. Departments of botany and zoology, geography and geology were wound up, and elements of their mission resurfaced in departments like evolutionary ecology biology or uh, molecular and cell and development biology, earth sciences, environmental studies and sciences, and so forth. Now, many universities committed themselves to women and gender studies or ethnic studies and cultural studies, and then worked continually to refine these formations to include the fields that had earlier ignored or folded uncomfortably into other omnibus sort of areas of study like history and literature. At the, as the best colleges became more expensive, various strategies, some that faced legal challenges later, were adopted to increase the presence of minorities and underprivileged groups in colleges and universities. Universities were always pretty adept, at least in the US, in making themselves known to potential graduate and professional students overseas. They now renewed their efforts to attract the best college students from beyond the usual foreign countries in, uh, in Europe, Canada, and a few rich Asian metropolitan centers. So for much of the period between 1950 and 2000, external collaborations were shaped heavily by Cold War strategic concerns and international development assistance. It is well known and well debated that area studies programs emerged from the direct investment of the US government in the learning of foreign languages and the study of foreign societies and cultures. 
across the humanities and social sciences, war and development brought the funds that allowed many universities to become centers of excellence in the study of Russia, of course, but also China, Japan, and to some extent other parts of the world, uh, like the Arab world and Latin America. However, it's also the case that these investments were fairly small, their returns greater than expected, and in the long run, they unleashed a host of unintended consequences. Beyond the government, that is beyond the US government, foundations, including national entities like Japan and Korea Foundation, also got involved and by the end of the 20th century, wealthy and politically mobilized diaspora from different parts of the world had also made small contributions to the enhancement of international studies programs in colleges and universities that showed some willingness to receive these inputs. Now, area studies programs emerged, for the most part, as small and somewhat exotic, often tropical islands in the ocean of liberal arts education. They still managed to create some ripples in the sea as they changed a few currents and provided a few destinations that did not exist before. Much of this effect was only felt in the faculties of arts and sciences, and there too, mainly in the humanities and a few other disciplines like political science, anthropology, which embraced the project of studying non-Western cultures and civilizations as part of their founding heritage, which was the case in anthropology, or by creating structural necessities in the form of subfields like international relations and comparative politics, which was the case in political science, that actually required some relevant expertise in the faculty and offerings in basic undergraduate curriculum. If area studies began to dot the landscape of liberal arts with the odd edifice, it remained mostly on the fringe, beyond the gates of the mansion, and rarely more than a curiosity to be sampled if the fancy took the student. In professional schools, notably schools of law, business, health, stud health sciences, education, music, and art, the international remained systematically out of bounds. These colleges of practice were uh, definitely charged with preparing the professionals who would build America and bring the American way abroad where possible, most notably in agriculture and engineering education, but also in medicine and architecture. It was this approach to the place of international and liberal education that started to change in this last decade in a few experiments that began across a small number of campuses in the US, and Yale has been one, I would like to believe, of these pioneers. The specific accomplishments of the last decade as summarized in Yale's international uh, activities most recently are impressive, and I just want to mention a few. Uh, the launch of the Jackson Institute for Global Affairs, the progress we have been making on the Yale India Initiative, the establishment of the Global Health uh, Studies and Initiative Program, the creation of Yale Annuous College, you already heard from my colleague Pericles Lewis on that, uh, approval of new undergraduate majors, and hiring new faculty who concentrate on international topics, uh, the School of Management's Global Network for Advanced Management, and a considerable effort and energy going into the development of new online courses with students participating from around the world. And this, of course, is also happening in some other campuses as well. So this list highlights, I think, uh, and I'm about to end, uh, uh, the more basic shifts that can only briefly be mentioned at this point. As many of the listed new beginnings suggest, international education at Yale now encompasses both faculty of arts and sciences departments and key professional schools, and this is reflected in several interdisciplinary majors that actively involve faculty from professional schools in teaching, mentoring, and leadership roles. You have heard directly uh, uh, from the president of Yale and US College, a brand new venture in Singapore that has been described recently by the president of NUS as an example of the kind of collaboration that seeks to produce a hybrid institution. Now, <clears throat> A combination of need-blind admissions, active recruitment of students from all over the world, and enhanced financial aid programs has also begun to reflect the demographic change in the international students at places like Yale, where the foreign students no longer come uh, from a narrow brand, uh, a narrow uh, band of privileged access in their home countries. There is much more to be done, of course, in recruiting and educating the smart but underserved young of poor countries and expanding liberal education in different parts of Asia, for instance, can be one way to make a dent in that problem. And Yale recognizes that without the faculty and students who are immersed in these issues, the university can't make headway on them. 
The biggest challenge, of course, has been finding ways to extend the reach of international education into the remotest corners of the basic college curriculum. Notably, departments in the humanities, often the bastions of the core curriculum, are often notoriously deficient in international expertise and coverage. Thus, till the end of the 20th century, it was possible, I, I would uh, suggest, to be a top-ranked comparative literature department or a history of art department or even a political science or sociology department uh, without having any research and teaching pertaining to vast swaths of the world, uh, Asia, Africa, Middle East, Caribbean, Pacific, uh, and so on. And it was entirely possible to be a distinguished religious studies department without any offerings in the study of Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism. Now, th this is much less feasible, and, and I think in that sense, uh, the tide has turned somewhat. But the battle which largely remains is to move measures of excellence in these core areas of liberal education to include coverage of civilizations past and present that are not seen simply as forebears of Euro-American heritages. At Yale, we have approached this problem by working to devise a more interactive relationship between area studies and disciplines, work that has led in many respects uh, by the efforts that have been undertaken by this initiative since 2008. So to conclude, the challenge, as former Yale President uh, Levin noted, is to become a truly global university educating leaders and advancing the frontiers of knowledge, not simply for the United States, but for the entire world. And it is in that spirit that several of us are here to work with colleagues from India and other institutions in the US. Thank you for coming and joining this task. <laughs>